How's it going you guys? It's Scott with Everyday Solar and today I want to show you how to set up a sand battery or even really a sand heater with a few simple components. We just have some solar panels, some simple wiring coming into a heating element. Here we're using an electric cooktop element, but we will be stepping things up to at least one water heater element. So this one is rated at 5,500 watts. In reference, this would be 1,500 watts. So we'll be able to step things up quite a bit and show you how to kind of match the element size to the panels you have to try to get the most out of those and then test how much energy, how much heat are we able to put into the sand and does it actually hold on to that? Again, we're not insulating anything here, but how long does it hold on to that heat and could it actually be at all practical for a source of emergency heat? So let me show you the setup and we'll jump into it. So on the outside, I just have two Trina 395 watt bifacial panels. You do not have to have fancy panels for this. And in fact, you could just get some used panels off Facebook Marketplace. I would recommend getting some larger panels. You could do more than two panels if you want. Right now we have two panels and they're just wired in series. And then just bringing those cables in now I'm just bringing them through the door. Obviously you're going to need to get a little bit more sealed up than that, especially if you're using this at a heat source and you don't want to lose any heat. But for this testing, I am going to run it through this power meter so we can see the voltage amperage and overall how many watt hours that we put into this. This has been just that cooktop element. So it's running 74 volts, about 1.85 amps. And then we will see it scroll through. That's giving in the lower left-hand corner. We'll do amp hours next. And again, this was just a short test. So 200 watt hours we put in and we're doing about 136 watts right now. But we're gonna step that up. So then I just ran that over to the element itself. And of course, I just used some Wagos. I clipped off the ends of the element, modified the Wago inline splices a little bit, and then was able just to connect those up to make it easy on, easy off. But now I do want to set this guy up. Again, this will be substantially more. We'll connect this up and then we'll start to run our test. We'll calculate out what the resistance is for this using Ohm's law, and then also looking at just power equals current times voltage. And then we'll see what the power meter is reading off and start taking our temperatures, seeing how we're warming up the sand. Probably every hour I'll take those temps while the sun's out. And then we'll see how long does it actually hold on to that. Okay, so for our testing, we'll do a little upgrade. I want longer heating elements. Those hot water heating elements will do better. So I'll put two of these actually into our pot of sand. And they don't have to be all the way down again. We're not going for complete efficiency here. It's more of a proof of concept to see how warm we can get the sand. And then I'll just wire these in series. It'll be basically two resistors in series. And then once I get those connected up, I'll use those inline Wago lever nuts and connect up our solar wires. So we start testing things out. All right, so now looking at the power meter, we're still at about 73 volts and 3.4 amps, bringing about 250 watts. All right, so we're almost up on the hour here for our first temperature point, and I have a few temperature probes that we'll see what's going on in different locations, and then also a FLIR thermal imaging camera, which will see the outer skin of that clay pot. And that's really gonna depend on how close those probes are to the wall of the clay pot to see how hot it's getting. I'm thinking this is gonna get up eventually to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, but we'll see. Now we're gonna do a little math here and why we would do that is just to check out our power, our voltage, our current and our resistance. Knowing those numbers, what we're seeing on the power meter, what we're seeing with the system, does that jive with the math? If it does, then we're confident in our wire and we're confident in our system. If there's something that isn't jiving, then we can start to troubleshoot. If you don't want to do the math, just jump to this timestamp right here or check the timeline down below and then you can start into the first results of how hot is this actually getting when we're checking the temperatures. So the two different equations that you would use is just power is equal to voltage times current and Ohm's law, which is voltage is equal to current times resistance. So if you don't know the resistance 
of your heating element. One, the easiest way is to use a multimeter and then just set it to resistance and measure across the two different contacts and you'll get the resistance. We did that for the kitchen heating element and got around 37 to 38 ohms. And we could check that out using these equations. So I could, I know it's a 1500 watt is equal to, it's running at 240 volts. So what current would that pull? So that's where we would take 1500 watts, go ahead and divide that by the 240 volts. Now we're looking at our current and then that would equal where current is equal to 6.25 amps. Then we can go ahead, now we got voltage 240, we got current at 6.25 amps, we can find our resistance. So if we rearrange that equation around, we're gonna go resistance is equal to voltage divided by current. So resistance is equal to 240 volts divided by 6.25, or resistance is equal to 38.5 four ohms. So again, multimeter is going to be your easiest way, but just having the power rating and then also what voltage it's running at, most likely 240, you can go ahead and find your resistance as well. Now that was for the cooktop element. We're using two of those water heaters, which I measured with a multimeter, and those were 10.8 ohms a piece. Remember, we got two of those in series, so we would actually have 10.8 plus that 10.8 equals 21.6 ohms resistance for the water heater heating elements. Now what I'm doing here is just checking things off. So if I know my voltage, remember we said 73 volts is what we saw coming in on that little power meter is equal to I times 21.6 ohms Okay, so now I can take the 73 volts divided by the 21.6 ohms, and now I'm gonna get my current, rounding to 3.4 amps. So then that's what we would check on our power meter to make sure the math jives with what we're actually seeing with our recorded results. And looking back, we're right at that 73, and we see about 3.4. So it looks like everything is good from our wiring and our system setup, and then the math checks out with our overall system. So the first hour is in the books, and I'll keep these two temperature probes in the same spot for the whole test. So front one's looking at 111 Fahrenheit, and the back one's 135. Now that's obviously warming up, but you might be like, that's not that impressive. So let's take this probe, let's go a little deeper, see what's going on here. Especially as we get a little closer to those heating elements, you can start to see we are way hotter down into the sand. We are at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, even just after one hour. So it'd be really interesting to see the whole volume of sand, what that gets to after about three or four hours of continuous solar. And it has been pulling 250 watts continuously, and it's been nice and sunny without any clouds coming over. You can see we have two different sample points. The red dot in the upper right hand corner is the maximum temperature it sees across the whole video feed. 266 degrees Fahrenheit is the maximum that this unit can pull in. So it's right at the element, makes sense. The element is over 266. And then we have a sample point. We can go out here on the skin temperature and see what the pot's reading in. 82, looks like the base has a little bit more heat at about 130. Now let me go over to the other side here. And we can see we definitely got a hot spot over here. That hot spot's 163, where I think that heating element's getting pretty close to the wall. So I might back that out just a little bit, but we'll continue to monitor it, see how warm that gets in terms of the surface temperature on that clay pot. So second data point, we're two hours in. I did move this temperature sensor from here back to here, as you can see them a lot better in the video than when we tried to use this guy on the back to show how hot we were getting there. Now the back one's still in the same spot, so it's 159 compared to 135 on our first hour, so after two hours, and that is pretty far away from the actual heating elements. And then down closer to the heating elements, we're almost at 380 degrees Fahrenheit, and we are still pulling 250 watts of solar. So we'll continue to go on, see how hot we can get this, and then also see how long it holds on to heat. To see after the sun goes down and solar goes out, how long would your heater be radiating heat in your room?
So now we're three hours in and the sun is starting to go down. You can see our power instead at 250, we're now at 190. So let's check our temperatures. So temperatures have definitely moved quite a bit. This back one, now we're in the 190s, approaching 200. And you can see we're well into the 400s at 424 degrees Fahrenheit, just about four inches below the surface here. So now let's get the FLIR camera out and take a look at the clay pot. All right, so looking at the top surface now, you can see we are quite a bit warmer. 266 is again our highest point there at the he heating element, which makes a lot of sense. The overall skin temperature now 130 degrees Fahrenheit. We got a 166 degrees Fahrenheit at the bottom. Now let's check the other side. All right, so now on this side, remember we had our hot spot here. All right, so that guy's about 195. So now solar is done for the day and we're starting to cool off. So we'll measure how long does this thing actually hold heat and would that be a reasonable heat source once the sun goes down if you're trying to heat a small room or maybe part of your home, especially in an emergency scenario. Now, I love these type of projects, these DIY setups. I think there's tons that you can learn from this and have some practical skills in different scenarios. But if you're looking to offset your complete power bill, that's going to be a whole different setup. And for most of us, that is going to be a professionally installed system. Now, if you want to start where I did on the first system that I got installed, you can check a link in the description. And with a few simple questions about your home and your setup, you can get an estimate on what size of system you'd need to offset your power bill and roughly what does that cost. If that looks reasonable, they can also set you up with installers in your area so you can start vetting them out to see if those are the right partners for you. Alternatively, I also did this. If you want to take that on as a DIY project, you can actually do that as well. And we just finished up a 4.8 kilowatt system, a smaller system that I installed on one of my rental properties using Project Solar. And they helped me design, get the permits, order everything, drop it off, and then I took on the labor and that helped me save a ton of money. So you see both of those different links and you can select the better path for you if you wanna start exploring those options. So let's jump back in and see how long this sand battery will actually hold that heat. We are no longer producing solar. Solar cut off at about three and a half hours. And overall, we are able to put in 725 watt hours of energy into the sand battery. So that's all held in heat. Now I want to see how fast does this actually decrease in terms of temperature. You can see our, temp our higher temperature center closer to the elements is all the way down at 307. Now this is after four and a half hours and about an hour after the solar had cut off. Now the back temperature is holding pretty strong there at 200 F but I wanna give it a couple more hours to see how much it holds onto. And then we'll talk about how can you actually use this as a heat source and then pull that heat back out to your room now that solar is gone. So we're two hours later, that's a total of three hours after solar cut off. The back temperature sensor is still at 165 and then that front one is at right under 200, 196. So we are losing temperature, at least from that upper surface. We still have a nice warm clay pot. And then we have this heat fan here. I wanna show you this is kind of the next iteration I'll be doing. And that's how do we get the heat around the room? If this was truly emergency heat source, we're trying to heat a room, well, we gotta have some air movement. So what this heat fan does, it takes the difference in temperature that's pulling out of the sand at the base. There's a little base in the sand. And then the difference between this grill up here, that difference, there's a thermistor in here that creates a small current. And then that current drives the little motor. The motor turns the fan. We only have right at the cusp of spinning it right now. But if we could heat this up more with more solar, like we could tomorrow, this would start spinning at a much higher rate and actually start to move some air. So this will be some future testing that we do. But Overall, I'm pretty impressed with this. This is a super simple setup, basic components, no complexity, no portable power station, no batteries, and you're able to keep a energy source heat and then use that within your house. 
I think that's pretty cool, but I want to know what you guys think. Let me know down in the comments, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? And I do encourage everybody else to get down in the comments because there's always just gems in there to help build upon what we talked about in the video. So if you want to dive a little bit deeper on more solar projects, check out this video right here. That is that DIY grid tied and roof mounted system. It was a major project, but I saved a ton of money doing that myself. Or if you want to check out our solar shed that's powered by a small portable power station and powers everything in that shed, check out the video down here and we'll walk you through that complete project. So thanks for joining me on this video and we'll catch you on one of those next ones. Take care.